class that deals with spiritual warfare. And you don't get to choose whether or not you're going to be in it. You get to choose the side to deal. The enemy wants our mind because if he gets our mind, he got everything. But God wants our body and our mind. If we can give him our body, he'll renew our mind. The spiritual warfare, the maturing of the Christian, and how to protect your family and really be a force for good. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rich Lockett, and this is Pause for Praise. It's a class that teaches us how to use the tools of prayer, fasting, worship, and scripture to fight against the enemy and to live a victorious life in Christ. It emphasizes the importance of putting on the whole armor of God and standing firm in faith. This class also provides practical tips on how to identify and overcome spiritual attacks and how to walk in the authority that Christ has given us. Overall, Paul's for Praise is a powerful tool for anyone seeking to deepen their understanding of spiritual warfare and grow in their relationship with God. Now, today's class is gonna be on the gift of mercy coming out of Galatians 5.22. And so the main ideal explores the abundant mercy of God and our calling as Christians to reflect this mercy in our interactions with others. So the scripture is powerful. It says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Galatians 5.22 Now my friend Charles Spurgeon says this. He says, mercy there is great and mercy there is free. Now, we'll get more into that. But good morning, my beloved family of God. It's a great joy to gather together once again in the warmth of our shared faith, united under the banner of Christ's love and grace. Today our minds are on a topic that is essential to our Christian walk as the air we breathe. Mercy. The mercy we receive from God and the mercy we are called to extend to others. Charles Spurgeon, yeah, he's a great preacher from the 19th century. But he did say, mercy there is great and mercy there is free. These words are simple yet profound. They encapsulate the heart of our topic today. Mercy in its divine form is both abundant and unearned. It is a gift from our gracious God, a testament to his enduring love for us. So our guiding scriptures today is from the book of Galatians. Let's read it again, 5, 22 and 23. So it says simply, but the fruit of the spirit, not fruits, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And this verse beautifully illustrates the qualities that are born of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. Mercy encapsulated in the kindness and goodness mentioned by the Apostle Paul is a key component of this fruit. It is an essential attribute of the heart that is in tune with God. A heart that reflects his divine nature as we move forward into this class. Let's pause for a moment in opening this gathering with a prayer. Heavenly Father, Father, we come together this morning thanking you, O oh God, for waking us up. Thanking you for opening our eyes to see another day that we've never seen before. Thank you, O oh God, for giving us the mind to seek you and to find you and to look for you, O oh God, uh, in your word and your ways, O oh God. So we ask, O oh God, that you come in, O oh God, in our class. Have your way in this class, God. Blow in our ears, Almighty oh God, the wisdom that you have packed into this great gift called mercy. We'll be forever grateful and give you all the praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So we come to the threshold of a class. 
poised to step into that vast landscape of mercy as we do, let us remember that mercy is not just an ideal to be understood, but a quality to be lived. It's not just a topic for a sermon, but a calling for every believer, every believer. Let's look at mercy not as a distant abstract concept, but as a practical and tangible expression of our faith. Are we ready to embrace the call of mercy? Are we prepared to let the Holy Spirit cultivate this fruit in our lives? Can we, like our Savior, be vessels of mercy in a world that is dis desperately in need of it? Let's find out together as we step into the heart of our class. Now, the manifestation of mercy as we look at the words of Apostle Paul in Galatians, we see a beautiful picture of the fruit of the Spirit. I love that fruit of the Spirit. Among these fruits, we find kindness, goodness, two attributes that are closely linked with mercy. They are not just qualities we should aspire to, but they are the evidence of the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. They are the tangible manifestations of God's mercy flowing through us. We can't produce it. So when we talk about mercy, it's easy to think of it as a grand sweeping gesture. But more often than not, mercy is found in the small, everyday acts of kindness, in a gentle word spoken to a hurting friend, the meal cooked for a neighbor in need for or the forgiveness extended to someone who has wronged us. These acts of kindness, though they may seem small or powerful demonstrations of God's mercy, they are the ways we can show God's love to those around us. But his kindness is not only manifestation of mercy. Goodness, another fruit of the spirit, is also a crucial aspect of mercy. See, goodness is about our character our integrity, and our moral compass. It's about doing what's right, even when it's hard. It's about standing up for justice, fighting for the oppressed, and speaking truth in love. Goodness is the backbone of mercy, which acts of kindness are built. The Bible is full of examples of people who demonstrated goodness as a manifestation of mercy. Think of the Good Samaritan who went out of his way to help a stranger in need. Mm -hmm. Or consider Esther, who risked her life to save her people. These individuals don't just do good deeds. They're embodied in goodness. They are vessels of God's mercy, shining his light in a dark world. But mercy is not just about what we do. It's also about our attitude. See, patience is another fruit, patience of the Spirit. It's a key aspect of mercy. Being patient means bearing with others, even when they frustrate us. It means waiting for God's timing, even when we want to take matters into our own hands. Patience is a quiet, steady manifestation of mercy. One that requires humility and self-control. So, finally, mercy is all about faithfulness. When we are faithful, we are reliable and dependable. We keep our promises and we stick with people even when the going gets tough. Yeah, how about that? Faithfulness is a powerful manifestation of mercy because it shows that we are committed to showing God's love no matter what. But so as we reflect on the fruit of the Spirit, let's remember that these are not just qualities we should strive for. No, remember, they are the manifestations of God's mercy in our lives. Yeah, they are evidence of the Holy Spirit's work in us. And as we allow the Spirit to cultivate these fruits in us, we become vessels of God's mercy, bringing His love and grace to a world in need. Mercy as a heart condition, as we continue to reflect on the fruits of the Spirit, we find ourselves drawn to the heart of the matter. The heart in this biblical sense is not just a physical organ, 
beating in our chest, but the core of our being, the seat of our emotions, will, and intellect. It is from the heart that mercy flows like a river nourishing the dry ground. The heart condition that fosters mercy is one of humility, and humility in its simplest form is the recognition of our own need for mercy. It is the understanding that we all are fallible, all in need of grace. The humility is beautifully illustrated in the parable of the Pharisees and the tax collector. Look at Luke 18, 9 through 14. The tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And his heart was ripe for mercy because he was steeped in humility. A heart that is conditioned for mercy is also one that is filled with compassion. Compassion, the ability to feel with others and to share in their joys and sorrows is a powerful catalyst for mercy. The story of the Good Samaritan, Luke was it, 10, 25 through 37, is a prime example of this. The Samaritan moved with compassion, showed mercy to the man who fell among thieves. His heart was not hardened by prejudice or indifference, but softened by compassion, his heart. Finally, a heart that is conditioned for mercy is one that is marked by love. Love, the greatest of all virtues, it's not a fruit, it's a virtue, it is the wellspring of mercy. It is love that compels us to show kindness to the unkind, to forgive the unforgivable, and to extend grace to the undeserving. The story of the prodigal son, Luke 15, 11, 32, paints a vivid picture of this. The father filled with love for his wayward son showed him mercy even when he did not deserve it. It is his heart was not ruled by resentment or bitterness, but governed by love. The Greek word for mercy used in the New Testament is elios. It is derived from the root word eliomosani, which means pity or compassion. The word is used multiple times in the New Testament, often in contrast of God, the context of God's mercy towards humanity. For instance, in Ephesians 2, 4, Paul writes, but God being rich in mercy, Elios, because of the great love of which he had us, loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Here, Elios is used to describe the depth of God's compassion toward us, his willingness to forgive us and give us a new life in Christ. A heart that is conditioned for mercy is also one that is committed to justice. And I ain't talking about just us. I'm talking about real justice and mercy. And they are not opposing forces, but two sides to the same coin. So justice without mercy is harsh and unforgiving. While mercy without justice is weak and enabling. The prophet Michael in Micah 6 through 8 calls us to do justice and love kindness and to love kindness. And he said, walk humbly with your God. Now, this is a call to a heart condition that balances justice and mercy, that upholds the rights of others while extending grace and forgiveness. Lastly, a heart that is a condition for mercy is one that is open to transformation. Transformation, the process of becoming more like Christ, is at the heart of the Christian journey. It is through the, this process that we'll learn, learn to extend mercy to others just as God has, uh, has, has extended mercy to us. So the Apostle Paul in Romans 12, 2, urges us to be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This is a call to a heart condition that is open to God's transforming power, that is willing to be molded and shaped in the image of Christ. 
Have mercy in action. Man, let's take a look at that. Mercy in action, as we move forward towards, we find ourselves standing in the doorway of mercy in action. It is here in the practical application of mercy, stop it, that we truly begin to understand its transformative power. Mercy, you see, is not just a feeling or an attitude, it's a verb, an action. It's something we do, something we give, something we live. The gift of mercy, the divine grace that God bestows upon us is a treasure beyond measure. It is like a wellspring of water in a parched land, a beacon of hope in a world shrouded in darkness. But this gift, as precious as it is, is not meant to be hoarded or hidden. It's meant to be shared. It's meant to be given away. This brings us to our first point of focus, the gift of mercy. God's mercy toward us is a gift, pure and simple. It is not something we earn or deserve. It is something we receive freely from his hand. The divine and this divine mercy is a reflection of God's character, right? A testament to his boundless love and grace. It's a it's way of saying, I love you. I forgive you. I accept you just as you are. But we got to get this part. The gift of mercy is not just about receiving. It's about giving. It's about taking the mercy we receive from God and extending it to others and becoming a conduit of God's mercy channels through which his love and grace can flow into the world. And this truly is where the rubber meets the road, saints, where faith becomes action and where belief becomes behavior. Yeah, all these things connect right here and combine right here. So now, let's consider loving others. This is kind of the second aspect of mercy in action. It's one thing to receive God's mercy, but it's quite another to extend it to others. This is where we truly begin to embody the spirit of Christ to live out his teachings in our everyday life. I mean, we really fully embody it. We really put this on. We wear this thing. Now, my buddy C.S. Lewis, he's a renowned Christian author. You might have read some of his stuff. Once said, to be a Christian means to forgive the excusable because God has forgiven the excusable in you. Yeah, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you and me. And this quote encapsulates the essence of loving others. So it's about forgiving the unforgivable, loving the unlovable, and showing mercy to those who seem least deserving of it. But it's still about reflecting God's mercy in our interactions with others. It's more like about becoming his hands and feet in a world that is crying out for love and grace. But loving others is not just about showing mercy. Come on, stay with me, right? It's also about receiving it. It's about opening our hearts to mercy that others extend to us. Yeah, it's about acknowledging our own needs for grace and forgiveness. It's about recognizing that we are all in the same boat, all in the need of God's mercy and grace. Now, we've been through a few things, but this is one of our final points of the focus on this call to action. Mercy in action is not just a theoretical idea. No, it has a spiritual component. It's a practical calling. 
It's a call to live out our faith in intangible ways to put our beliefs into a practice. It's a call to be the hands and feet of Christ in the world that desperately is in need of his love and grace. And we are part of the plan. So what does this look like in practical terms? Simply, it looks like forgiving those who have wronged us. Even when it's hard, it looks like showing kindness to those who are difficult to love. We got them. Even when it's inconvenient. It looks like extending grace to those who seem least deserving of it. And when it's uncomfortable. So, in the conclusion of this act of mercy and action, it's, it's about living out our faith in tangible ways. It's about taking the mercy we receive from God and extending to others. It's about reflecting God's love and grace in our interactions with others. So I hope you're drawing in on all of this stuff because it's, 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 it's the real meat and potatoes of it, right? It's about becoming conduits of God's mercy channels through which his love can flow into the world so let's rise to the challenge saints let's embrace the call to mercy in action let's be the hands and feet of christ in the world that is crying out for his love and grace as a matter of fact let's show the world what it means to be a follower of christ what it means to be a recipient and a giver of God's mercy. So, as I wrap this up and I wrap up our time together, let's remember that mercy, like all the fruits of the Spirit, which really is fruit of the Spirit, is not something we can manufacture on our own. Remind ourselves it is a divine quality, a gift from God. And it's only by his grace that we can truly embody it. We can't do it on our own. It is his mercy that we are just simply reflecting. It's like the moon, you know, reflecting. And so when we choose to forgive instead of holding a grudge, when we extend kindness to those who have hurt us, and when we offer love instead of judgment, God's mercy is a beautiful thing. It's vast and it's deep and covering all our sins and failures. It is his mercy that sent Jesus to the cross for us. And it's his mercy that offers us new life in him. So as we go out this week, let's remember to live in that mercy. To let it fill us and flow out of us. Let's be conduits of God's mercy. Showing the world his love and grace in tangible ways. All right, all right. I know you're saying, bro, lock it this long. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, Father, thank you for opening up our eyes and minds and our hearts to this wonderful gift called mercy. And thank you for letting us know all the different attributes of it and ways that we could show it. And thank you for reminding us that this is a gift from you. This is not something that we can do on our own. You are mighty God. We love you with all our hearts and minds. We ask that you bless us this week, oh God. Watch over our first family and our pastor and our families all across the St. Stephen counties. And we ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So, the way to really look at this thing, this gift of mercy, is pretty simple. And so, may the love of, may the God of mercy fill you with his love. That's what I wanted to say. May the God of mercy fill you with his love. May he guide your steps and guard your hearts and grant you his peace. May you walk in his mercy, reflecting his grace and love to all you meet. And may you always remember that you are deeply loved fully forgiven and eternally blessed in Christ. So today, go in peace and serve the Lord with gladness. Amen. God bless you all. 
Let's go out and be the hands and feet of Jesus, showing his mercy to the world. Amen. Amen. So I'm Rich Lockett. This is Pause for Praise. See you next week.